Greetings, I'm Sean Creighton. Uh, on behalf of the New American Colleges and Universities and the Washington Internship Institute, welcome to this very special event, American Civil Discourse in Our Polarized Times, a conversation with C-SPAN founder, Brian Lamb. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about, it's gonna be brief here, my opening remarks, but, uh, you know, as our nation and world becomes more divisive and polarized, it seems like this this is a really timely conversation. And we're uh, delighted to be having it with with the visionary, Brian Lamb. Uh, who, who took an idea, combined it with his passion and his motivation, and, and turned this idea into what is a critically important American media network. And uh, I promised Brian I wasn't going to go on too long. So uh, you know, we'll, maybe we'll put a, tra- a bio in the chat or something like that. But I want to highlight a few things, uh, some things we already know. Uh, Brian is a journalist, an author, a podcaster, a founder, a retired CEO, a Navy veteran, and the list could go on and on. Um, He's a graduate of Purdue University where he majored in speech and where you can now find the Brian Lamb School of Communication, which, yeah, which I think is a real testament to turning a a speech major into a vocation and uh, and ultimately a legacy. Uh, Brian's received the Presidential Medal of Honor, the National Humanities Medal. Uh, He's Based on the conversations we've had with him, just getting to know him this week, he's he's a genuine, caring, friendly, funny, visionary. And, um, you know, Brian, thank you so much for all you've done and all that you still do and, and for being our, our special guest today. We're, we're excited to spend this time with you. Uh, you know, as the format, uh, I'm going to stop talking in, in a matter of seconds uh, and hand it over to the moderators. But uh, the conversation will be broken into three parts. One, we're going to learn more about Brian. Uh, two, we're going to discuss civil discourse. And then we're going to continue that discussion uh, with your questions later on in the program. So at this time, I'd like to introduce our moderators. Uh, June Speakman is a professor of political science at Roger Williams University. June is also one of the Washington Internship Institute's biggest champions. Thank you, June. Uh, she's, going to be, uh, she's going to be joined by her co-moderator, Calissa Ward-Hill. Uh, Calissa is a senior at the University of New Haven, where she is majoring in international affairs. Uh, Calissa is currently in D.C. through the Washington Internship Institute, uh, where she is an intern at the Association for Diplomatic Studies and Training. And we learned Calissa will be graduating next month, December, uh, from UNH. And Calissa, we're just going to congratulate you now. I know you have a month to go, but uh, congratulations. Um, Thank you, Jew and Calissa, for moderating today's discussion. Uh, uh, it's time for me to stop. Let's begin part one. Tell us your story, Brian Lamb. Over to you, Calissa. Thank you, Sean. That was amazing. Um, so, Brian, I just want to ask you, what brought you to D.C., and when did the idea of C-SPAN come to mind? Listen, I got to D.C. in March of 1966 in the United States Navy. And C-SPAN kind of was born in and around my experience in the Navy. Uh, I was in the Pentagon for a couple of years and watching the three commercial television networks in the middle of the Vietnam War. Uh, I can talk on about this, but basically it was seeing the war described in from only one perspective. And I, always, I thought during that time, there are a lot more perspectives that we ought to be aware of. Yeah, that was great. Thank you. And then how did you go about starting that? I am. Um, while I was in, while I was in the Navy, I was attached to the White House in a in a part time situation. The title of what I, I had at the time, in addition to my work in the Pentagon, was social aid. And all that really meant was that I dressed up in my uniform and put some gold braids on and was on call to the White House whenever they needed. What really was in, basically our job was an extension of the first family um, and uh, to help the president uh, in social situations. And, and so I'd get asked over the White House a couple of times a week. It was really nothing more or less. It wasn't important. It was nothing more or less than just getting to observe people. And it was through that that I met a lot of people. Then I went to work 
eventually on Capitol Hill. Uh, and I saw up close what it was like up there. Uh, and again, it was narrow what we were able to see in the country about the Capitol, uh, Capitol Hill. The m majority got all the attention on the television networks, unless somebody in the minority did something weird, which is how you make news. Um, and, uh, you know, in the midst of all this, and it's a longer story, I ended up working at a trade press publication called Cablevision, introduced myself to the cable industry, started talking about this possibility. And once the satellite went up in 1975, we could afford to do something like C-SPAN. Wow, that's amazing that you went from ground up. Um, so how were you able to turn it into C-SPAN network of today? What got you to do this? What motivated you to push forward? You know, um, th th this is hard to describe, but I, I had from the beginning 22 board members and each and every one of them ran companies that were responsible for building cable systems and carrying networks. They deserve 96% of the credit for making this happen because if they hadn't said, yes, we're gonna do this and paid the bill, we wouldn't be here today because it doesn't, it's a nonprofit. It doesn't belong to uh, any shareholders. I don't own it, never did, never will. And so they were responsible for helping me learn how to run a business because I didn't know. I did not graduate in speech, as Sean said, uh, and that doesn't exactly train you to run a business. So as I look back on the last 45 years, if it hadn't have been for these business types, we wouldn't be here. And that's probably the story that never gets told because the media doesn't want to write that because they'd rather write about one person. It's, it's a lot easier. No, that's very interesting. Um, and who were the most interesting people you've interviewed over the years and why? The most interesting people I've ever interviewed. The, the presidents are always interesting, not because <clears throat> it's exciting, uh, because it's unusual that you get that close to a person who's president. And so you just take it for what it is. You never... You rarely break any news because they're talked with so, by so many people. Uh, but that's always fun. But the most important people to me over the years have been historians. And uh, I didn't know much about history when I started. I've had uh, about 30 some years of interviewing historians. And it's a fantastic experience. It's taught me everything I know when it comes to um, history and people and biography and the people, the names some people will have never heard of. David McCullough is probably the biggest name. He uh, died last year and he was a wonderful human being. He wrote books like the John Adams book, the Harry Truman book and, and, and others. Richard Norton Smith, who's just finished a book on Gerald Ford, uh, has become a close friend as Doug, Doug Brinkley, who the, the best thing about Doug Brinkley was not the best thing. The thing that was interesting is he he had a great program where he had students on a bus and they went around for six weeks. They earned credit and they went to American historical sites and he taught them history. And so we stole from him his idea and we bought a couple of buses and those buses went around the country to schools for 25 years or more. And the last one I'll mention is Harold Holzer, who introduced me, believe it or not, even though I'm from Indiana, to a man that lived in Indiana for 14 years by the name of Abraham Lincoln. And Harold Holzer has written over 50 books about Abraham Lincoln. Wow, no, that's, uh, that's amazing. Thank you. Um, and then what would you what would your advice be to young people in general as they think of their professional yeah. you're like me uh, and more specifically uh, those people who are working on the Hill or other institutions like DC? You froze on me and I, but I think I got the, the gist of your question and I don't know. I, it may be our Wi-Fi service here. Um, you know, Knowing what I know now, 
Uh, the very best thing you can do if you're really interested in history or coming here to town and working on the Hill is get an internship. And if you can't get an internship, wait until after you graduate and figure out a way, save your money, talk to your parents, whatever it takes, get a part-time job and come out here and be here because jobs yeah. pop up just like that. And you got to be ready to go. And if you say, well, I, I'd love to be there, but I can't be there for six weeks. You lose. So come here, come here before you graduate, start to network and, but look for that internship. I can't tell you how many people, in this company came here as an intern and now our vice presidents. Uh, it just works. It makes a difference. All right. No, thank you, Brian. And as all a question with that, would you advise those young professionals uh, to go abroad? Do you think that would be worthwhile? Best thing that ever happened to me is going to the United States Navy and spending uh, I went to, I think I counted once 17 different countries in the Navy. Uh, and it was the best thing for me. I had, you know, I lived in a small town. I hadn't spent much time out of the small town in Indiana. Uh, but getting out of this country and seeing how other people live yeah. is fantastic. I don't want to bother you with it. So, yeah. Although Brian Lamb's on it, he's cool. You know, <laughs> cool. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, well, no, thank you Ryan, for letting me ask you a few questions. I'll bring it to June. Thank you, Calissa. Uh, first, I know you don't like praise. I've learned that from our brief interactions here as we prepared for this, Brian. Uh, but I... Uh, I have to say that I am deeply grateful for the service that you bring to us uh, political science professors because we can bring C-SPAN into our classroom um, every day. So thank you for that. And I also appreciate the comments that you just made about going to D.C. When students say, I don't have a job, I don't have a place to live, I say, just go, it'll work out. And your comments about internships as well, that's really important. So for all the students um, who are listening in, take that advice. That's very, very, uh, very good. So um, the theme of this um, conversation is American civil discourse in our polarized times. So if you could speak for a bit about how you see that polarization, is it as bad as the mainstream media tell us? Or uh, do you think it is, uh, are the headlines exaggerated? What's your take on polarization right now? Well, uh, I may disappoint you in my comment yeah. because I am not as disappointed in polarization as a lot of people are. Uh, if you go back in history, and I'm sure you have, this is kind of small potatoes compared to the Civil War, uh, compared to the days when they dueled. They dueled in this country among politicians till about 18, I think it was 1876 was the last duel. Uh, it's been a very mean, difficult time for our country from time to time. And this is, you know, if you had to list the five periods in our history that were the most difficult, this would be on that list of five. Uh, I think the thing today is that we know everything all the time, every day, instantly. And so we're right in the middle, whether it's what's going on over in the Middle East right now or in Ukraine, we know it immediately. I can go home every night, sit down and see live pictures coming out of Kiev or wherever it is. Uh, and I think that makes a big difference because during the Vietnam War, and this is just a tiny little example of the difference. If you were a television reporter in Vietnam for NBC, ABC, and CBS, you couldn't go live. And in order to get on the air, you had to film at that time your story, put it on an airplane that would take at least 24 hours to get to New York City. And it was even doubly more uh, doubly difficult for the correspondents because the people sitting on the desks in New York really responded to the printed word at that time, as they still do. And so they had to leak their story off into an Associated Press, get it printed. And then when it came into the Bureau in New York, they'd say, oh, this is important. I just read about this. So it's changed dramatically since then. And I think that's part of the reason that uh, it's nasty here right now. Uh, but think about it. If you only have three vote margin in the House of Representatives and two in the United States Senate, why wouldn't it be nasty? Because they're, it's all about power and money and uh, importance. And um, 
I, I'm frankly, I'm not surprised. Well, thank you. I'm not sure to be whether to be hopeful or more depressed based on your comments, but thank you for that. That does put it into historical perspective, which is really important. So those of us who watch C-SPAN um, know that you do uh, gavel to gavel uh, coverage of Congress without commentary and also do uh, the call-in shows where you have Republican and Democratic uh, callers and there's a, a apparently no attempt to take a particular perspective, unlike virtually every other um, media source that we watch. Why do you think it's important to provide that uh, I don't know if you like the word unbiased, but that kind of un unbiased and almost unmediated coverage of politics. I guess the word, I don't know quite know how you define what we do. It's uninvolved. Um, you just don't bring your emotion into the situation. So when I'm doing my work and everybody else here does their work, they don't really care who wins. It's just not our job. We try. This is an, This, by the way, after 45 years, is still an experiment. I don't know. I mean, we aren't getting the kind of numbers. We don't have ratings, but we know how much, you know, a, a general idea of how many people watch. People do like watching their side only. They're much happier watching their side only. Or going over to a side they don't agree with and ranting for a while. I mean, that's all part of the game these days. And I'd have to say that um, we've, been, we've the experiment, if you were looking at strictly audi audi audience numbers, C-SPAN has been a failure. We, are, as an organization, have failed so much as the public is not as interested as you might like in being able to hear both sides. I'll be very brief, 30 seconds of this. The morning call-in show from 7 to 10, seven days a week, is the most balanced place in media in the United States. One minute you hear a Black person speaking as a conservative, which is always strange to people who are black and liberal. You hear a Jewish person, you hear a Catholic person, you hear a white person, you hear a liberal, a conservative. Every call is on different sides of the spectrum. And you don't hear that anymore. If you listen to radio or television, you only hear that side. Even when in television, when they make like they have somebody at the table who's on the other side, you know, best example is when Fox News has a Democrat on, usually they're a Democrat that is not quite a Democrat. And MSNBC has a Republican who voted for George Bush. It's just a different world today. So is there something that C-SPAN thinks it can do to um, get more viewers to appreciate that or to use the resource, that uninvolved kind of presentation of politics, to use it? more widely or, or to get professors to use it more widely. Do you have a plan for for a lot, uh, for getting more of us uh, to take a look at what you do on that morning show and other shows? I think you'll understand this, Professor Jen, uh, that if the professor is interested, they pull us right into the mix. But if they're not, and a lot aren't, they don't want that video. They don't want somebody outside of that. We don't get in the door. It's like everything else in the society. Thank you for what you do, because I think you give young people an opportunity to start learning now and learn for the rest of their lives as long as they're interested. My father used to say all the time, uh, you've got to have time to watch these men. I don't agree. I don't particularly agree with that so much as because my technique of watching C-SPAN is I'll watch it 10 minutes here. A couple hours later, I'll check in for another 10 minutes. If there's something that I really want, we have an archive that is free to all users. You can call anything up and watch the whole thing. And uh, it's a more than anything, it's learning how to use it. And it's hard. To, it's a hard sell. Well, keep it up, please. It's important. To, We're trying. Thank you. And I think you should bring the buses back. I remember the C-SPAN bus coming to Roger Williams University, and it was fabulous. It generated lots of student interest. So get those buses back on the road, if you will. Thank you. <laughs> um, so in getting back to the, the um, notion of civil discourse in our polarized times, do you have anything to say, I'm sure you do, about the role that colleges and universities can play in uh, encouraging more civil discourse? if we can even define what that is. I don't know that students would agree with what I'm going to say. I mean, uh, I think in colleges, uh, you can find yourself in an environment where you're only getting one side. 
And I think that you'd be better off to bring people into a campus on all sides and let them talk. We have been doing this now for 45 years and we've never had anybody suggest that you shut C-SPAN down. Uh, and we have people on a daily basis on the far right or the far left. It works. And universities who have this environment that people say, that person is not going to speak on my campus, makes a, they make a big mistake, in my opinion. Have them on campus, ask them questions, keep it civil, but the ranting and the raving and the screaming and hollering, and that person's not going to appear on my campus. I have no truck for that. I don't agree with it. I think it's I think it's shallow, and I think that you're better off letting people hear all the different sides. It's not hard to make up your own mind, in spite of the fact that people are afraid to hear what the other side is. Countries in our history, and I'm going to be very brief about this. I happen to be interviewing a guy tomorrow about Hitler's book Mein Kampf. And all you need to know is study Hitler. You can see where only one point of view was heard that it did break everything down and the frustration was very high. Well, thank you for that. Um, so how do politicians bear any responsibility for encouraging civil discourse? We saw, as you pointed out in, uh, when we were talking before we opened the session, there were three inc incidents yesterday of, uh, of that approach to physical violence in Congress. Um, is there some way to encourage our politicians? How do we do that? What role do citizens play? What role do the electeds play in, in trying to foster civil discourse? I'm not sure this would, what I'm about to say will foster discourse so much as foster understanding bad discourse. Mm -hmm. And I think it's up to the citizen to understand what's really going on right or wrong, the television camera causes some difficulties and allows people to show off, uh, gain an audience, have their 15 seconds of uh, time in our society. But if you understand it and you don't just take it at face value and you know what they're up to, it's easier to take. I mean, you know, I watched it yesterday and I shook my head and we laughed about it and everything else, but I didn't dwell on it. I didn't think about it at all until you brought it up. Uh, I expect this and have for years. We used to have a guy, Bob Dornan, a congressman from uh, uh, California, who was a conservative, almost had an actual fist fight on the floor in my time with uh, the former Speaker of the House, Jim Wright. Uh, Jim Traficant from Ohio used to say the strangest things in the whole world in one minute speeches every day. And you just have to factor it in, uh, I think, and learn how to live with it. But I don't think, I don't really think there's any way to stop the uncivil discourse other than time. And leaders, I think politicians are significantly responsible for a lot of it. I just interviewed yesterday a man um, named Coppins. Uh, who has a book out on George Romney. I, George Romney, that's how old I am. That was his father, Mitt Romney. And it is a terrific back, behind the scenes um, treatise on how it really works. Because Mitt Romney, who's not going to run again, talked on the record about how it really works. And if you want to, don't come in here with a gee whiz attitude if you're coming to Washington and getting involved. Uh, it's not going to be that way. And um, Mitt Romney, for whatever reason, finally, you know, I don't want to say finally, it's not fair to him, but it, he told the truth. And the truth is not pleasant because people in politics play games that a lot of the people and I, this is not me saying this, it's him saying it, a lot of the people in the Senate, for instance, who support Donald Trump. He says, tell him privately, they can't stand it. And they do it because the constituent out there says, you better support him or I'm going to throw you out. And that's what's going on. It's a, it, there's a dynamic here that people ought to stop and think about before they buy what any of them say. I'm not, I'm, I'm, there's a, there's a lot of lying that goes on in this town every day, both sides. And that's something you got to understand. People are, not how, telling us the truth. How how does 
C-SPAN help people to distinguish the lies from the truth? Or what is the best way for an observer of American politics to make that distinction between the lies and the truth? I guess that's two questions, isn't it? We make no attempt directly to, to tell you this is true and that's not true. And everybody gets all excited about it. We, but, but And they say, you have a responsibility. Well, my truth is not yours. Uh, and our point is, if we bring in all sides, then you can make up your own mind. And that that's a chore. It's not easy. People love to have somebody make up their mind for them. I mean, when you sit down in front of a Fox or an MSNBC or a CNN, those people are all telling you their point of view. And you've got to work at it. It's not easy. You have to work at it. Now, I say you have to. You don't. You can accept whatever you want to accept uh, as being the truth. But it's, um, it's complicated. And journalists now, I mean, can you imagine... <clears throat> one of the journalists that I, I won't name him, you might even know this, uh, just sold his house for $31 million. Oh. What in the world are people in our business doing making $31 million? You know, I mean, it's it doesn't it, it's out of whack with reality. It used to be a business that uh, people were, you know, just they, they may have had a college degree, but they weren't the high rollers. And we've gotten to the point in this business where the kind of money that's being spent on television journalists is obscene. We don't make that here. We do well, but nothing like that here. Uh, and that's skewed everything. And, and that's interesting. Down here at the local level where I work, uh, journalism is dying. Local journalism is dying. There is uh, Local newspapers are shutting down. Statewide newspapers are shutting down. Uh, so it would be wonderful if some of that money were funneled down to the local level where folks can learn more. I, I'm, I'm not going to ask C-SPAN to come and start covering uh, town meetings, although that would be a great, uh, that would be a great gift to the, the people. But uh, it is, um, it's ironic, I guess, or unfortunate that I, I didn't realize about the $31 million home. Um, I would uh, let folks know that you're free, by the way, to enter questions or comments into the chat. We will get to that very shortly. So please feel free to do that. Um, so uh, this get your comments about voters and the audience needing to be able to make up their own minds when they're presented with op opposing viewpoints, I think, as you point out, is difficult. And uh, here I am, a university professor, wondering what our role is. Again, we've sort of covered this uh, in, in helping students and everyone else to, to do that. Um, or even earlier, what, is, what are your thoughts on, on civic education and when do you think it should start? And what should it look like so that people are equipped when they watch C-SPAN to make up their own minds and to distinguish truth from untruth? I don't know. I'm not an expert on when things should start. Um, when I look back on my own life, I was not a good student in high school or college. But what did have an impact on me in both cases is I was involved in student activities in high school and was a class officer. And that taught me about just the basics of uh, running for office and all that stuff, which I never wanted to do after that. But in, high, in college, we had a mock political convention. It was a fabulous thing. And this is <laughs> before all of you were born. Back in 1960, um, we had a mock political convention on Purdue's campus in which we had people that represented the different candidates. And in those days, it was John Kennedy and um, Richard Nixon and um, uh, also uh, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson. And we had parties and all that stuff. And we were to pick two people, one to be president, one to be vice president. And in the end, they picked, believe this or not, this was in April before anybody had any idea this would happen in 1960. We picked John F. Kennedy to be the president and Lyndon Johnson to be the vice president. Wow. And John Kennedy called us. And he said, I will never forget it. As Purdue goes, so goes the nation. Uh, that experience, and I was responsible for a documentary for it and being the voice on the documentary, which I, I love doing. We can't find the darn thing. But <clears throat> that was so important to me in my education. And I had some really good professors, history professors, history of religion professors, uh, people that were, uh, you know, and in high school, I had a, a, 
I, matter of fact, I got a picture back here of him on my shelf of my high school broadcasting teacher. Terribly important. I think it should start as early as it can without being foolish. I mean, you know that fourth graders usually end up at the, coming to the state capitol. Eighth graders end up cap, coming to Washington. Um, I'm not sure what that does except for the people that start to get interested. And then eventually you get back here after you've gone to college or you do an internship. Well, um, just so you know, on university campuses, role-playing games are very big pedag pedagogy right now. A lot of my colleagues are using simulations. Model United Nations is big again. So it's good to know that what goes around comes around. Everything old is new again, right? Not that you're old, Brian, but you did mention I, the 60s. <laughs> I, I am old. Yes, I am. I understand that. <clears throat> but I mean, I, most more importantly than anything is I was not a good student. But if you're interested, the number of places to go to learn become an autodidact are phenomenal. Nothing like that existed when I was uh, back in, in college. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Um, so tell us before we hand it over to the, the um, audience, um, it's clear that you love what you're doing. So what is it you love most about your gig? Um, this is going to sound, uh, probably won't even sound like it's true. I love coming to work every day because I really, really enjoy the people I work with. Number one. Secondly, I enjoy watching the process. I've always been the kind of person that um, when I was in the Pentagon and I was in the Navy and it was in the middle of the Vietnam War, uh, when the People would come to Washington to demonstrate against the war on Saturday. I'd put my jeans on and go down to the mall and hang. And nobody knew who I was or what I did. And I just wanted to be in the middle of it. When the Million Man March came to town years ago, these were all black men. And um, I had one of the most fantastic experiences. I decided I wanted to go uh, to the middle of that group. I wanted to find out. So I went to the head uh, up near the Capitol and I walked down the middle of this group that went all the way down the mall. And I was so excited by the end of it. Now, number one, because how friendly people were to me. And number two, they would yell out, see you on C-SPAN. And that you know, we have a high percentage of black viewers. And I always thought that one of the things, and I'm not a chess beater and I'm not a politician, I'm not involved in these issues, but I always thought one of the things that would happen when we came into being is that African-Americans in this country could be seen like white people doing exactly the same thing, being chairman of the committees, being on the committees, being members of Congress and not be singled out just because they're of a certain color or a certain identity. And that's been one of the real pluses over the years as listening on the morning show in the morning, how often folks identify themselves. I'm, I'm black and this is the way I feel about it. And they can be on there the same level with everybody else. So uh, that's been part of the experience of, of, of being involved in it. Well, thank you for that. That's an aspect of C-SPAN that I was unaware of, the demographics. Thank you. Calissa, do you have anything else uh, or should we go to the chat? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it was phenomenal. Everything you said was amazing, and I appreciate the demographics. I, again, like June, I did not know that, and that was amazing to hear. Uh, and I was just curious on your, like, international perspective. I, I'm all about international affairs, so I just, I'm curious, like, what do you think in regards, like, would you do anything in the sorts of interviewing abroad or like go and see the perspectives of what we should be seeing as U.S. citizens and future, you know, diplomats and politicians. I'll let, I'll let you in on a dirty little secret. Um, you may know this because you're of the age that probably are living this way. Young people are not subscribing to cable. We have lost millions of customers in the last seven years, millions. We used to have a total number of 94 million payers, meaning they give us six cents a month. And now we have close to 50 million. We're down half as many. 
We every time we lose a million people, that's worth about seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to us that we lose. So we do not have the kind of money we used to have to go international. We had a channel one time that we were going to devote to international. We used to travel a lot. We went all. I mean, I've been all over the world doing programs uh, that we put on C-SPAN. We can't afford it anymore. We're not. We're actually. We've we've done this. We've gone up, and we're now going down. And uh, that's obviously sad, but it is the fact of life. And it's because you are going other places for your news and information. And the good news for us is that we have enough money in the bank to last another three five to five years without getting new money somewhere and either changing the structure of the company. But I, it, the same thing's happening to everybody else. Although I will tell you this, and this is trying to understand what we do. In the beginning, it was more emotional on the part of the people that supported us for a number of reasons. One, they, the idea of having being a civic-minded uh, citizen clicked in. Number two, they wanted new programming that they could afford, and we were, we were that. Uh, and number three, on the cynical side, they thought, this is very few numbers, thank goodness. They thought this would be an entree to members of Congress. And so I, I watched all that happen. So as the media changed its structure and the technology, the new, the new people, and I'll give you an example, YouTube, which created its own service, you can buy it for $65 a month, refuses to put us on their service. They're not emotionally involved. They don't give a darn. They have so much money that they don't sweat it. And so you have a whole different mentality today. A lot of the new people coming along who are worth trillions do not support this little place. And uh, if you can hear the slight anger in my voice, you can see that it, it's all a matter of you, if you are civic minded, you say, put that on there, even though it may not have a large audience. But it's, it's what you learn after if you've done it as long as I have. So is yeah. there, are there plans for a, a, another business model? Is there <laughs> a subscription model? Is there, I mean, we can't lose C-SPAN. It's a vital natural national resource. Well, you're a young woman. So in the next three to me? five years. No, yeah. that's Calissa, not me, yeah. but thank yeah. you. <laughs> no, I'm talking to you. I, <clears throat> stay tuned for the next three to five years and you'll find out because it's a work in progress. All right. Good to I mean, know. It, it's, it's a tough, I mean, it's, it's a tough time because of this. Yeah. Thank you. I'll, I'll stay tuned. Um, back, Sean, uh, can you um, connect us with the folks in the chat? Thanks, Jan and Calissa for moderating uh, the first two parts. And uh, yeah, we have we do have a question in the chat. And, and, and while I read this one, it's from Eric Schumann. But before we just want to encourage people to either uh, put other questions in the chat or raise your hand if you want to speak directly. Uh, but let me go to Eric Schumann's question. Uh, so Brian, do you think uh, social media has increased polarization in the, in the general public? Even if polarization has existed in the past, is it more generalized now? And does this increase the visibility of polarization make it even more acceptable? Well, first and foremost, I love the change because it takes the power out of, in most cases, by the way, some people have abused their power, but it takes the power out of the big companies, the big power bases, and allows the individual to be involved in it. Is it sharper in the way of civil discourse? Probably. I don't want to offend anybody. So what? I mean, it's, you know, people, one of the great frustrations is in a democracy like this or a republic is that if only certain voices can be heard, then it builds up inside these different groups. We've never had more groups, more people having a say so. Uh, I love every minute of that. Do I like the bad discourse from time? No, but you know, the learn to turn it off. 
I mean, that's that. And you're not going to control it. It's never going to be controlled for the rest of your existence, no matter what people think. I love when I hear somebody say, we need a fairness doctrine. Just try to regulate a fairness doctrine in the world we live in now. Impossible. I think we had a question from the, the classroom. Emily, I, I'll turn to you. Emily, where are you? She went off to eat her lunch. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Hi, Brian. Um, I just had a question about, um, you know, coming from a very civically minded person. Um, I've observed that people my age are growing more apathetic towards politics and policy because of all this polarization. So what do you think C-SPAN could do in the future to reach out to these younger generations and, you know, really engage them with what's actually going on? Um you know, and reach out to them instead of like TikTok and the media kind of getting there first. Emma, I, I'm not sure you can do anything. When I was growing up, uh, they were, young people were less interested by far than they are today. Uh, you, you, you were in a bu complete bubble. I mean, if you didn't read a newspaper, there was no internet at all. And, and people didn't really, certainly in school, watch watch television um i don't know how you know the everybody in the country is trying to get young people more interested um the remember that when i was growing up it was, you had to be 21 to vote now it's 18 that was a big change you had a draft and that scared the daylights out of everybody and it got people's attention because if you were on a college campus and you thought you had to go to vietnam that got everybody's attention People were doing everything, including going out and getting married and having a child because there was such a thing called Kennedy fathers. I never understood this. If you had a child, you didn't have to go. That was crazy. Uh, and it, it and so it's every, you know, period of time, it's different. And I don't know what the answer is, but, you know, on your you're involved. You're never going to get everybody involved. And I think you ought to take advantage of the fact that you are involved and do the best you can to encourage your friends and others to, to and show them where they can go to find things that they can understand. This stuff is not hard to understand if you pay attention. You got to pay attention, though. If you're a sucker sitting out there accepting everything you're getting, both from the media and a politician, it's your fault. We have a couple more questions in the chat, Brian. Uh, what do you think of the role of community access TV stations going forward? I don't think it's worked out very well. What has worked out incredibly well is YouTube. I mean, that I'm a, in spite of the fact that I'm disappointed that YouTube won't support this network, I find that uh, what's available on YouTube to be just absolutely phenomenal. I use it all the time the number of documentaries on there that, that about any subject you want is phenomenal and i watch one my own way i get up at three o'clock in the morning every day and the first thing i do is exercise and then the second thing i do is find a documentary to watch during the 45 minutes that i exercise it's the greatest educational tool or and i do this you know, I watch C-SPAN during the day from time to time or at night, or I get on our archive, which was created by a college professor at Purdue University by the name of Robert Browning. He invented it. We now own it. Frankly, Purdue didn't want us to stay on campus. So we said, fine, we'll go do our own thing and hired Robert to do it full time. Uh, and Thank goodness that he came along and was willing to do that. So you can watch anything that we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week for nothing. Thanks for the question, Brian. Uh, and the answer, Brian, other Brian. Um, Joe, we have a question from Jody. Uh, where do you get your news? Well, I guess you kind of talked a little bit about that, but yeah. Where, where do you turn for your news? Ah, uh, well... This is really old fashioned, but I have five <laughs> newspapers here that I read every morning when I get in the office. Um, 
I'm constantly on the internet going from left-wing publication to right-wing publication. I particularly like it when I can go to the internet and find a report that came out of the government. Uh, the government issues today something or there's something in, you know, I'm a, I'm following the Trump trials very closely. And I go to the court, which is about three blocks from here and sit in the court and, and uh, watch the process. I sat through the Oath Keepers trial and the, the uh, Proud Boys trial, studying the judges and the, the, the lawyers and the, and the defendants and all that and the juries. Uh, but all of that stuff, when they issue a statement, you can go right to the, to the internet and get it. Uh, and that's how I entertain myself. And I do it 24 hours a day. My wife, my wife who doesn't, she's very smart, but she doesn't care about this stuff. She always says, I understand why you have to do this because it's what you do for a living. And I wanted to, I keep saying here, it wouldn't matter whether I was doing it for a living or not, I'd still be doing it. So you're either born this way or get interested this way, or you don't. Now, did I hear you say you get up at three in the morning? I do. That, it, okay. it, I do. Right. And I go to okay. bed at seven. Well, that was my question when, when yeah. you go to bed. So, okay. Yeah, I'm not a night owl. In other words. But maybe I am because I, you know, but I've been, on a schedule, I've been on a schedule for years because I used to do the morning show on C-SPAN at 7 a.m. And I would get up, but it really started back in the Navy when I was what they call a, an admiral's briefer. And I had to get up in the morning at three go to Union Station, which is a block from here, pick up all the newspapers from all around the East Coast, go to the office, clip the stories, and be ready to tell the admirals at eight o'clock what was in the news uh, that day. And I've never gotten away from that for almost 55 years. Well, we're gonna turn back to the classroom where I think Emily, uh, another student has a question. Hi, yeah. Um, so my question was kind of about um, reporting and journalism. Do you think it's really possible to have like objective opinions in journalism that are like bipartisan and that aren't specifically filed to one side? I do. And there are some fabulous reporters that do stay that way. Uh, there are some interesting reporters that don't. Uh, you you, you got to read them closely. It really depends on the individual, but uh, I love journalists. They're interesting. They're interested. They're curious. I love to read them all. I love to, it's, it's one of the great experiences I ever have in the morning. I'm sitting at this desk in my office by about five thirty, six o'clock and I've got these newspapers and there's a story that's told on every newspaper's front page. And I, it's, just a very exciting way to live if you're interested in this stuff. And there are, I can pick them out. I follow them very closely. During the whole Trump story, you know who hates Donald Trump and you can see it in the copy. You can see it in the first paragraph. You can see it on what they choose as news. Same thing is true with a conservative newspaper. We have a couple here. One of them is the Washington Times. Nobody pays much attention to it. We do here. We use it on the air. Uh, they are, they do a very good job from a conservative's point of view, and you can always tell what stories the conservatives are interested in compared to, say, the Washington Post. And in spite of what you might think about the Washington Post and the New York Times, as good as you think they are, they are biased, and you can see it. Every reporter isn't, but uh, it's critical that you learn how to read this stuff. Not don't fool yourself and don't go around saying, because I love the New York Times, this paper is always doing the right thing. You might think they are, but they are not an unbiased institution. And uh, I get tired of people acting like um, the, the journalists are, are gonna be unbiased because they're not, they're human beings. You're all, look at your, your own views right now. You're listening to me saying, I don't believe that guy. He just said something I totally disagree with. And the next one person is going to say, you know, he's right on target on that. So just look at your own feelings about this. I watch television at home <clears throat> when I'm not working and I scream at the set just like everybody else does. That's stupid. Uh, and the, you do that because that's human nature. But I'm I'm alone when I do it. Or <laughs> my poor wife says, OK, yeah, I get it. 
we, we just have a few more minutes probably for a question or two. Um, I'll, I'll turn it back to Brian Alexander who asked, uh, can you say more about what you liked and learned about that mock political convention experience? Uh, he teaches teachers how to use games in education. So he's very, very curious. You, you know, I, it's obvious. Um, I mean, anybody that gets involved in politics, uh, you learn about who or who's a good organizer. Um, you, you learn uh, what influences people in a group to vote a certain way. You learn about name recognition among certainly among students. Uh, who would listen to what students? It's not a mystery. Um, and you could watch the process change. I mean, if you want to read about a, a good, uh, interesting political choice, go back and read about James Garfield. He he was not even in the, in the mix during the convention. And on the 36th ballot, they chose him. That's because they pushed this person aside and that person aside and that person couldn't get the votes. <clears throat> so they end up with a guy who would have been a good president had he not been shot. Uh, he was a very one of the smartest people ever to be president. But um, I don't have any great insight on, um, you know, what I personally gained out of that except curiosity. And uh, it was exciting and fun. And you can see why people get involved in it. So, uh, you know, we tend to put faith in the next generation to figure everything out. And uh, I guess, you know, what's, what's your faith in the next uh, political generation to, to work together, regardless of difference, to, so, you know, to solve problems for the, the greater good of society and our country and our world? I mean, <laughs> I've been... Um... Uh, I, you can't really call it teaching so much, but I've been involved in, in teaching uh, a class at Purdue for the last 12 years. I really like this generation. Um, they're smart. They're, and I'm talking about the people that I was involved with in political science and in, in communications. Uh, I, I just like them. They know more than I ever did when I was their age. We used to have a guy in the, house that I lived in at, at Purdue, who every week, and we make fun of him. He read Time Magazine from cover to cover. I doubt if anybody in this audience has read Time Magazine in the last uh, two years. Uh, it's just faded from, you know, being visible, but it used to be one of the most important magazines, along with Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report. But we would make fun of old Bob, <clears throat> but Bob knew a lot. And um, it when you're Often when you're young, there's a lot more important things to do than fuss over the news business. But, you know, I again, the younger generation that I come in contact with, I find to be stimulating. They ask absolutely spectacularly good questions. And because one one time during COVID, we had 38 guests and this happened within a period of two weeks and they were on screen only. And every student had to ask a question. And every student asks a great question. I've never, I don't remember ever saying that's a dumb question. And I don't think when I was that, that age, I would have done that the same way. So I have a lot of faith in today's younger generation. Well, we, we do too, certainly. And uh, we're, we're glad to have um, some of our students join us today. And we're getting to the top of the hour here. And so I just wanted to see if there's any, is there any final question from the students that they would like to to ask as we wrap up thumbs up i see a thumbs up <laughs> wonderful well um brian you know thank you so much for uh for being spending time with us today and um and thank everyone really for joining us but a, a special uh, shout out to calissa and june for being our moderators uh, also to uh, Rachel Katz at C-SPAN, who I know I couldn't have done this without Rachel. And she's right around the corner. And uh, to Emily. There she is. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Uh, to uh, to Emily and uh, to, to Michelle for helping make this possible. Uh, and, it, it, you know, it was an exciting conversation. We have recorded it. We will distribute it 
uh, to all of our attendees and, and broadly beyond that. And we will we'll close up by wishing everyone a, a calm finish to the, the fall semester and uh, and all the best during the upcoming holidays. So, and, and hopefully we'll see you again at a future NACU WE event. Thank you Take all. Care. Enjoyed it. Good to be with you.